Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to Creativity in Focus, a live video podcast where we highlight an artist, its art, and most of all, how creativity can impact your life. Today, I have a very special guest, Roxanne Vigos, and we are going to be talking about natural dyeing. But before we do so, a few announcements so you can help us spread the word about this podcast. First of all, this podcast, after we go offline, is available on any podcast directory that you can think of. So, for example, the Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, many others. So look for us, and you can watch all the episodes uh, on those platforms. So it's a great thing to do that because we have over 50 amazing interviews at this point with different artists around the country. And uh, remember one thing, we are live for one very special reason. We love your participation. So you are welcome to give your comments, you know, give your two cents about uh, the subjects we are going to be covering, or ask some questions to Roxanne about her art. They are all welcome. And the best way to do that is if you're watching on a social media, you have the comment box right below the post. That's the perfect place to put those questions I'm going to get here on my tablet and I will uh, ask her. If you're watching on creativityinfocus.com, which by the way is the best place for you to watch this, well there's a box below with a chat box. Use the chat box also to do that. And when you have a second, give us a like, a heart, you know, flowers, <laughs> depending on where you are, the symbols are different, but they impact a lot, the visibility of this podcast. So please take a second. Every comment that you make, uh, if you share this with your friends, it's content only. Nobody's going to sell anything during the next hour. So feel free to join in gro- to sharing groups and in places where you know there are people that are interested in natural dyeing. All those fiber artists, all those textile artists, yes, they would love to be here right now. So if you share this, they might come and, you know, join you and we are all going to have a fantabulous time. Okay? Those are my announcements. Well, I'd like to welcome Brooks and hey. Vigas. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah. I'm really excited. You know that I love textiles. Right? Yes. <laughs> and I've seen your pieces before. Yeah. And I've seen how you have pro- progressed on, in all this technique. Yeah, so we're going you. to talk a lot about that. But yeah, before we do, perfect. tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, gosh. So um, I, uh, I've been dyeing fibers now with natural dyes since 2014. But I started um, many years before that with um, synthetic dyes on silk. So I, um, I'm a belly dancer as well. <laughs> so I started dyeing silk because I fell in love with silk veils mm-hmm. and I just immediately wanted to create my own cause I had already been sewing parts of costuming and things like that. And so that's really what got me started. I think in the so textiles. The belly dancing <laughs> yeah. Actually, oh, nice, yeah. Nice. I know it's kind of an interesting and I was, I was uh, making jewelry as well for a long time and I had incorporated fibers into my jewelry as uh-huh. well, but it really started to like take over when I started dyeing veils cause they're big pieces of silk they're three yards so (laughs) it's a little bit of a challenge to manage that much fiber and luckily when it's silk it squishes up pretty small so that kind of that kind of started the bug of of dying isn't that interesting that one hobby can take to another passion and another passion yes right and i think that that empowers us (laughs) totally all the time you know that we are trying different things we're experimenting with different things absolutely but you said you started with with synthetic dyeing yes what made you shift to natural dyeing? That's a good question. So um, I have tried to maintain like a more holistic lifestyle kind of my whole life. I've really always been into like herbs and natural Mm -hmm. techniques to sort of heal the body and take care of um, maybe not just the body, even to the mind and the heart as well and Mm -hmm. holistic techniques. So um, I think... I mean, a lot of things shifted for me. I think I've told some people before that like when my mother passed away, actually, Mm -hmm. I had a big shift. And like all people that find some really important creative outlets, they come from things not necessarily being the best. The best, yeah. (laughs) Right? Sort of you you find yourself in a low place and you're just like, okay, I just need something else in my life that's going to inspire me and and sort of recharge my batteries. And I was at that point you were, you were not doing any of this. Mm -mm. Okay. No, I wasn't doing any natural dyes at all. So she passed away in 2009. Um, and I had been doing jewelry and I'd actually stopped belly dancing for a little while because I was just processing like a lot of grief actually. And, and, um, I just, I was looking through a magazine and I saw this, um, article about eco printing Mm. and I was just, 
totally immediately like drawn to it. And at that point, I had also been doing a lot of um, work on my own spiritual path with like kind of communicating with trees, <laughs> for lack of a better I heard term. Trees. I heard trees. I'm yes. guilty of that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the trees sign kind of simultaneously had become my elders at that point, because at that point I didn't really feel like I had any more elders left. My grandparents were gone as well, mm -hmm. um, and both my mother and my father had passed away, and so I I was kind of calling on the earth to sort of like help me mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and kind of show me the way to have a different form of communication. Um, so that kind of coincided, and I just started experimenting. I looked at the silk supply that I had in uh -huh. my um, my cupboard from dyeing silk, and I was wait. I was thinking, wait, I have silk. I have a yard. There's <laughs> got to be something that I can do with those two. And uh -huh. I've been identifying trees, so then those two just kind of basically spiraled out of control. Yes. <laughs> and uh, do you mind talking about grief a little bit? Yeah, for so sure. So you think that going through this process helped you? Totally. Uh, move forward yes. because we never overcome a, no, a loss, right? No, we don't. We, we sort of learn how to take it into our daily life. And I think the process of natural dyes, it's very, um, you can't always predict it. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, there's getting to be ways to predict it more. But the sort of um, process of, of allowing the dye to show you what it wants mm -hmm. was very healing. Uh -huh. And I couldn't really... I felt like I couldn't really attach myself to outcomes. I had to sort of be just present with the experience, which I think is a lot of similar things to grief. We can't really mm -hmm. say, oh, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm fine now. We have to sort of allow the, the, the phase to happen. Mm -hmm. So, and in natural phases and, and learning about um, the cycles of earth, the cycles of plants, the cycles of trees, all that birth and bloom and then release and sort of moving into other cycles, lended itself really nicely to healing. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because we, we, when we talk about creating and making, we always think that it's just uh, the pursuit of happiness, right? Like, right. I can yeah. create, it, which it is, but yeah. uh, for me, for example, this is the uh, one year exactly that my mother passed away yeah. and I don't oh, wow. have any uh, parents or grandparents yeah. anymore. Yeah. And many times I am creating and I'm okay. But it triggers a memory, mm -hmm. it triggers something, and you know, I tell myself it's one way to go through this process. Yes. It's especially, I know that the first year and the second year, they are yes. very, very difficult. But it, it helps us in this process, right? Totally. So the creation uh, allows us, our mind also, to find answers and deal with our feelings. Absolutely, right? yeah. That's great. Now, the Ecuador, I know you're a tree hugger. <laughs> I'm a tree hugger yeah. myself. I know, Nashla, when I'm in a bad day, yeah. she looks at me and she says, go outside and hug a tree. Yes. Because <laughs> I no. really do that. No, the, My there's neighbors a lot of think science. I'm a little crazy. That, uh, mine too. But I'm I get <laughs> barefoot and yes. I hug it. Barefoot is the best. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you need that energy flowing, right? Totally. So uh, when you did this shift to Echo Dying, yeah. there was more about it, right? I, I've talked to you many times before, and you talk about thrift shopping, of oh, yeah. uh, being mindful right. with your clothes. Right. So Let it, us know a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so it definitely started a whole um, journey into textiles, mm -hmm. and that comes up with pollution because textiles many people don't know it's one of the largest polluters in the world textile waste um, we have a society that takes clothes for a minute and then they become unfashionable and then they're sort of made fast and cheap and they tend to fall apart so we just throw them away move on but then that doesn't really go anywhere because it's usually made out of a fiber that might not biodegrade so yes. we think it's going somewhere, but it's really just going away from us we, we don't temporarily. We have an idea of how much plastic is in the fibers yes. that we are wearing. Right? Yes. The average American throws away 60 pieces a year. Yeah. Right. That's a lot of stuff. That is a lot. Yeah. I know. Cause, and then when people buy stuff that's like very inexpensive, it wears out faster mm -hmm. because it's not really made well. And so it's a, it's a cycle that is really hard to get out of. And so with the natural dyeing, that started me looking into, getting into like, okay, what are fibers made of? Where do they come from? How do, how do I eliminate my mm -hmm. impact on this really big problem? So yeah, that started thrifting. I started <laughs> thrifting. <laughs> well, so, but it's important, right? I, you know, I was not 
the kind of a person that would go very often to a thrift shop. Yeah. Especially because I have friends that they find the most amazing treasures right. in this place. Right. And I go there and say, but where do they find it? Right, how do they find it in all of the stuff, right? Yeah. But then I learned that really, even if you donate your clothes to, yeah. to thrift shops, only 10% get sold. Yeah, especially so the if rest they're kind of damaged. The yeah, or yeah. thin. Or, yeah. it's, a, it's a gap that we need to figure out how to find a good use for mm -hmm. recycled textiles, mm -hmm. right? So True. then I have all these textiles at my house that I'm like, oh my gosh, what do I do with all these? I've just been hoarding them. So I've been <laughs> trying to make them into like reusable produce bags yeah. and like yeah. cleaning rags. And there's a way to, even if it ends up in the trash eventually, it's still better to sort of like find five other uses for it rather mm -hmm. than just to throw it away immediately, so. Yeah. And, and, and we can never forget that can also turn into a small business opportunity. Absolutely. I was, I was camping a week or so. Yeah. Ago. And I met this lady from Florida, super crazy lady, yeah. but she has her <laughs> camper and she buys everywhere she goes, she goes to a thrift shop and she buys used jeans. Yeah. And then she makes this cute little bags. Actually, everything is hand sewn. Oh, cool. Nothing very special. It's yeah. a pocket of a, a trouser and something like that. I saw her sell, look at this, 60 bags in less than 30 minutes. Wow. The average price was 30 bucks. Right. Not bad, so right? affordable, 30 yeah. 30 minutes. So we, we were in, uh, in a group of other women that camped together or they camp with their campers. And she was there. She started talking about it. 60 bags. Wow. All from recycles. That's recycle so awesome. Program. It is. It, we have to think, really, it, it is outside the box, right? right? What else can I make with what right. I have at home instead of just throwing that totally. away? Because you may throw that away. It doesn't make the problem go away. No, it just increases the problem. <laughs> we think it's... I think that's the thing is like we think a way is kind of a weird term because mm -hmm. it's like it's not it's away from us yes, but it's, it's not still there it's not because you're not seeing that the problem it's, is not there it's still there yes yeah, somewhere Laura <laughs> then it's saying uh, hi from South Carolina hi. guest 4776 hello from Nova Scotia nice guys hello. if you have questions you know we um, there's classifications of fiber which would be wool and silk would be like your protein fiber fibers they come from an animal or an insect so they're considered protein fibers and they have a natural affinity to natural dyes mm. they sort of bond so often without um, the big word you hear a lot mordants mm -hmm. they often don't need a mordant there's a natural affinity for them to attach to the fiber without uh, the use of a mordant so it's very easy to use for beginners um, so silk comes from silkworms. So some people have a problem with that as far as like if you're, if you're vegan and you might not want to get into that process and that's totally understandable. I actually was vegan for a few years, so I understand. Um, I like it for its biodegradability. Like I like knowing that I could bury it into my compost pile in my backyard and it would eventually deteriorate. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big push for climate beneficial wool, which is wool that has um, been carefully thought of how each section of the wool production from the animal, what it's fed, how it's grazed, the um, waste the animal creates and how that can augment the soil and then eventually how that could um, benefit the person wearing the wool as well. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of this whole cycle that we're starting to think about as far as fiber production. So that's really cool. Um, cotton is what we love in the, <laughs> in the United States, right? We love our cotton. It's comfortable. It's breathable. Um, it, it tends to require a lot of water production, actually, to make, to make cotton fiber because the fibers are sort of unruly and they have to be spun and processed. And so that's another thing we think about when we think about not just the end, fiber, the end result of the fiber, but how much production it takes to get the fiber from the factory to us, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I do buy a lot of new fibers, especially for some of the items I sell where I want sort of a predictable result because that is the thing with, with plant dyes is different fiber is going to yield different results. Okay. <laughs> so you just, uh, you have to, you kind of have to be willing to go with it if you're, you're getting stuff from thrift stores because you never truly know. And now it's kind of weird too because I swear I get stuff that says it's cotton, but... Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that it it's is. But when you really say cotton. new fiber, what exactly are they? Do you know? What What was that? You said new fibers. New fiber. So um, just new production as new opposed production. to something okay. that's like an upcycled or right, recycled right. Uh -huh. or reclaimed. And right now there's not like a great way to reclaim natural fibers actually, hmm. uh, other than recycling existing garments. There's some really interesting things happening with recycled polyester which okay. is kind of cool. You know, you've seen those garments that are like made from plastic water bottles. So yeah. we're trying, we're trying to get uh -huh. that, you know, 
dialed in, and that actually takes less water. So, so you can dye. Uh, I've seen a lot of, pro of garments made. I actually had a, a friend many years ago mm -hmm. in Brazil that he used to, and you, you're talking about 20 or so years ago. Yeah. And he built uh, machines to recycle uh, the, the plastic bottles oh, wow. because he could see that that would right. be a huge problem. Wow. And there were also many cool things. <gasps> yeah, I, right. I've seen the whole process. And you can see this is awesome because you're really recycling something that takes forever. Right. 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 At least trying to give it a new life, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't use um, polyester in my natural dyes because it doesn't have an affinity. It's just a, something to note about water consumption. And, and being a natural dyer, you immediately, after you go through the process, you're like, okay, this actually does take a lot of water, and I need to be really mindful of how I use my water. Even in just a small-scale production like myself, I really don't want to just rinse and rinse and waste right. and you know, start pot after pot of fresh, clean water. I want to be able to like reuse my water and make the most of my mordants and, mm -hmm. and actually have keep it going, so yes. I'm using less. So. And, and if you... Uh, if you don't know, Roxanne is actually here in Utah, right? You live yeah. here in Utah, which is a desert, yes. right? So we yes. have to be mindful <laughs> yes. of the water that we yes, use. Yes, absolutely. Mandy is saying, I have never thought about the impact that our fabrics and fibers have on our planet. Thank you for enlightening oh, me. Oh, awesome. That's so cool. And, and you know, we, we really could go on and on about yeah. this because there's also <laughs> the impact that causes on on the workers of the fast fashion, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. This That's thing about thing. every two months you having the whole fashion industry changing right. causes many issues in other countries right. as well, right? right? It's not easy. But the topic here is natural diet, yes. so we're yes. going to, to <laughs> stick to that. Now, you you talked about natural dyeing. Yeah. What do I use to dye with? Give me yeah. some examples. Okay, so that's a that's a great next topic actually. So when I first started, I was using anything I could get my hands on that might give color. Uh -huh. So the first thing I tried was Virginia creeper, and um, the color is like kind of muted, right? It's that's not, a plant, the, yeah, uh, flower. This is a vine. It's probably oh. you've seen it a million times. It's, it's sort of invasive, and most people hate it. It's that <laughs> vine that like creeps up over your whole yard, and it's got purple berries. Oh. So it's called Virginia creeper. Um, so that was one of the first experiments I did. It's a really light color. It's probably not something I would use today, mm -hmm. but um, just knowing that I could explore and experiment with it was really fun. This is silk gauze. Um, this is actually rose petal, uh, which can can fade. Can you, so, let's, where can yeah. I hold this to show? Yeah, if maybe if we open. Yeah. These are just my uh, samples, so they're you yeah. know, a little bit, they're not finished pieces. You, you do a lot of studies around uh, how you die. Yeah, so, so you these take are this very, very my serious. experiments. Well, if you didn't say it's just a sample, yeah. I could totally wear this as a scarf. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So what did you use here? So this was actually, the first piece was um, a test for some leaf prints, and I didn't like how it turned out. And so then I had some rose petals, and I just threw it in the dye pot. So wow. I'm a very um, chaotic and messy dyer as well. So a lot of people are very methodical. And uh -huh. I'm sort of just like, if I've got a pot of something and I don't like one thing, I'll just throw that in the pot that's going and see what happens. So. What else do we have there? Um, this is actually from uh, tulip, Ooh, red tulip that. flowers. This is, again, just a scrap, but... So it's red just, tulips? Yeah, this wow. was a fermented dye, actually. So you kind of let it sit in a salt water bath in the window for a few wow, um, beautiful, beautiful. days. Yeah. Uh, this is a common one, black bean. This is from black, black bean. bean. Yeah, this oh, is look silk with black bean. So like I said, You're I was going to open all of just them. I'm sorry. I want to see it. <laughs> just trying everything out. This is actually quite a large piece of silk because I was dyeing veils. So this is, a, I think this might be actually a big enough piece to be what would be considered wow. a belly dance veil. So just for you, so. the, uh, the ones that will be just listening to this podcast, she used uh, black beans, you said? Black beans. Black uh -huh. beans. And yeah. we have this gorgeous light blue. Yeah. Uh, do you call this blue or do you have another yeah, name for that? Yeah, black bean blue. I mean, it's kind of gorgeous, a, it is gorgeous, like a gorgeous. really soft You would never think blue. this would come out of me. Yeah. Fantastic. And this is silk? Yeah, this is silk habitat, so it's got this really light, airy, sort of beautiful... Almost, you can see translucence, you know, it's light. Um, so this um, is from a tree. This is from uh, cottonwood catkins. You know, in the spring when the trees drop those little, um, they, you know, they're kind of spindly. It's like uh -huh. the seeds that come down. This was from the little catkin. So again, it was just something I had in my yard and I was like, why not try it? I don't Beautiful have anything green. to lose. Yeah. yeah. 
so that was um, my first, you know, dye plant experiments with things that are close to you, because that is really important, is to go on an adventure in your own neighborhood, in your own backyard, and just see what's there. That's the other thing, right? Because even with natural dyes, of course, you can go online and you can buy it. Yes, them. absolutely. But it, it's a, a much deeper experience if you go and sort that around right. around you. I, I don't... I don't do dyes, but I like to rock hound. Yeah. And it's a very unique thing when you find a rock and you go through the work of polishing, cutting, Absolutely. and then you turn into a jewelry piece. Yes. It has more value than anything else that you could buy, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Because you went through that process. Right. And I believe here is the same thing. Yeah. So I think that was part of the, um, not to jump back to the sort of grief in the healing aspect, uh -huh. but I think there's a sense of being rooted that comes from exploring your own backyard yes, in yes. such an intimate way uh -huh. with a rock with um, even people who take photographs same thing it's like really getting close with your it's, surroundings yes it's it's unbelievable yeah and i think it, it also uh, deals with the sense of belonging absolutely right? i love uh, that word so in much the, in the maslow pyramid <laughs> our highest need is to belong so yes. after everything is taken care of we need to belong as a foreigner here, yeah. I have that question in my mind oh, many yeah. times. You know, do I belong? Right. Aww. But you belong. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you. But it's, it's the rock hounding, it's yes. the wildlife photography, yeah. it's being around, knowing knowing who you have around, exploring. Yeah. Uh, that makes you think, yes, I belong. Absolutely. Because if you belong, you know you, you can also be impacting. Right. Right. And so, so it's not just going around your neighborhood looking for what trees and thinking your neighbors are probably really thinking you're a crazy lady. <laughs> They're calling the cops. On Do you me, have I a know. cat? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's just a crazy lady. Yeah. With a cat. I walk my cat too. So just Ooh. to take it next level. Like. Yeah. So the neighborhood said, "Oh, it's a lost case." Yeah. Here. But it's really important. And yeah. Then, right. Yeah. The pieces have another another. Uh, meaning here. Absolutely. Linda is saying fast fashion, interesting concept. I will start hitting thrift stores more often now. Oh, it did change nice. for me. Yeah, it, cool. it's really important. This is from a thrift store, this natural indigo dyed top. So I, I buy a lot of stuff that I just dye from a thrift so store. You so you bought this, what color was it? Before? It was white and oh. it's cotton um, and it, I just put it in an indigo dye and, and, then, and blue. And there it's you beautiful go. and yeah. it's very beautiful. Yeah. So when you go to the thrift store, uh, of course you, you will have to find what What's natural fiber there? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of looking into the yes. tags. Yes. Right? And yeah. you told me once that you don't even care if it fits you or not. Yeah. Why? Because uh, I can adjust it or cut it up and turn it into something else. Something else. Yeah. Uh -huh. This I had intended to make into a dress, but then I tried it on and it did fit me. So I just was like, well, this, <laughs> this is going to be mine then. But, you know, you, you don't have to think of the garment being an exact fit because you can customize it. Mm -hmm. Or if you need help with that, find someone who's a tailor and have them and help you. Yeah. I mean, but, you know, or, or just jump in. Uh -huh. And just try, and try it. Try something. Cut it up yeah. and sew it back together. No one's going to be hurt. <laughs> I believe that the question, who am I really, fits so well when we are trying to do this. Yeah. Right? How, you, you, what's your voice when you're dressing? Right. You want to, to say, this is me. What you're seeing, it is me. Right. Right? Right. And playing with the items that you get can mm -hmm. really take into that other level for you. Yeah, you're absolutely. not worried about if people are going to like how you dress or not. Right. But if what you're dressing uh, translates in who, into who you are. Right. Right. And the things you care about, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is the big part for me is like I, I care about not contributing yeah. to certain fibers that I don't want <laughs> on the planet. you don't want on the planet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> now you said about the ones you can find up around yourself. What others? Yeah. What other options do I have? Uh, so these are all, I mean, this is eco printing, which is a different process, but uh, this is all just stuff from my backyard. So this is a cut up t-shirt again, this is a sample, but um, it's really precious to me because it's one of the first pieces I made. So this is maple leaf and sumac, which are two very prevalent um, plant trees uh -huh. and plants in our area so that's another thing it's gorgeous too yeah. yeah and it's and we're going to, i'm going to ask you later exactly what was the process for kay. this one because okay. i bet people want to know yeah um same with this this is one of my favorite pieces now this is a rayon which is kind of cool too so uh rayon is a semi-synthetic it's made from wood pulp but it's extruded in a polymerization process so mm. We don't always consider it a nap, uh, eco fiber, but there are some practices in place that are trying to make it more of a, a green fiber. But and you use leaves on that? Yeah. Thing? So this is actually sorry, I should hold it up more. So this is um, 
actually there's a tree that people call sort of like a weed tree. It's called the tree of heaven, which it has such a pretty name. Uh -huh. um, it's really prevalent where I live in Ogden. And so it kind of just grows everywhere and people cut it down, they sort of hate it. And really? so this has actually got tree of heaven in it, which prints a really beautiful green color. So it's a beautiful green yeah. yes. The other thing that's cool about this is you can find like sort of these things that are considered invasive plants or weeds or, you know, oh, that terrible plant, I gotta get it out of my yard. So <laughs> maybe it might be a good yeah, plant. It's, it's interesting because uh, the other day I was listening to a podcast about real estate. Yeah. But the guy said, well, the first thing, if you're buying land, the one thing that you need to pay a lot of attention is if there is bamboo there. Oh. If there is bamboo, you never want to buy the piece of land. And I looked at Ashley and I said, that would be the reason I would buy the land. Right. I know how to make so many cool things. Yeah, bamboo, yeah. But it's an invasive. It never right. stops growing. But, but the fact is, it depends on how we can use that because you can yes. make amazing things. With totally. Bamboo. Yeah. There's a way to turn it into something. I read, I was listening actually to a podcast about a couple who um, they bought some land and it had invasive mulberry trees. Oh, uh -huh. And sort of mulberry, everyone like went in and yes. cut it down and they ended up um, starting to harvest it and use it for medicinal purposes. They so were awesome because they turned... mulberry was the other example he used. Yeah. He wouldn't buy. Yeah. Yeah, the mulberry leaves make a really pretty green dye too. That's another tree. <laughs> so and yeah. finding trees that are sort of labeled as like bad trees is kind of like a great opportunity. Yeah. What about insects? Um, yeah, good question. So uh, there's two primarily that are used in historical plant dyes. So cochineal, uh, which gives a pink color. It's a little, it's a scale insect. It lives on the prickly pear cactus tiny it's really cute and little um, so and this one could bring up problems with people who maybe are vegan and they don't want to do the whole insect thing which I totally understand um, uh, I really like it because it is a historical plant dye and the where, the place I source it so I don't find it locally although I've heard that it does uh, live in southern Utah yeah I actually heard the lady the other mm -hmm. day saying she had an, an invasion in her <gasps> In her garden. I need her number. And, and she was asking <laughs> the weavers, actually, yeah. a group of weavers, you want to come get yes. some for yourself? Yeah, you Do literally it. just yep. scrape it off and use it. Yep. Yeah, so. And it's amazing how powerful the red that comes out of it. Right, you, you saw I that. Did, yeah, I took a <laughs> workshop a few weeks ago with Roxanne, and we all we all use cochineal, and the reds that came out of it are it's unbelievable. It's so vibrant. Yeah, so it goes anywhere from pink uh, to deep red to magenta to purple, depending wow. on how you modify it. So it's a really it's a really fun dye to use. And I heard cochineal is also in some food items, right? Yeah, so it's uh, red number 40, I think. So some people may have even allergies to it, which is something, you know, you could have an allergy at any point. So it's mm -hmm. something to consider with even with plant dyes too, right? Because we, we do kind of think of natural equal safe, and that's not always the case because it yes. might not be safe for you, uh -huh. it might be something you don't you don't have uh, your body doesn't like, yeah. <laughs> but mine does, so that's good. <laughs> Other insects that you use for um, dye? There's another one called uh, lac or stick lac, and um, I've used it a little bit, but I kind of chose to stick with cochineal as my main source for source pink. For yeah, okay. the, the place I get it from, they. Um, they have a family that supplies them, and it's kind of cool because the family's been harvesting, in, or sorry, harvesting cochineal in their family for like generations. So uh -huh. keeping them in production, I feel like, is a good thing. That's cool. So. And I know there are many other items that we can use in the dyeing process. So we are going to talk about process yeah. next. But Mirna Muro is saying, saludos desde Lima, Peru. Bienvenida. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, Catherine wants to know, how do I dye with black beans? Ah, good question. So. Um, the best method that I have found is to do a cold soak. Mm. So you don't actually apply any heat at all. Oh, really? You let the black beans soak in a jar and then strain out the beans and then you have this sort of really deep liquid and then you would put it on um, silk or wool to just try and see what's going to happen. If you want, um, that's a great question because if you want your dye to stay or have a longer, what we call color fast or light fast, you would want to start to get into mordants. Okay. So that's so usually... explain to us what a mordant <laughs> yes, is. Yes, that's usually the scary word that everyone's like, what is a mordant? Yeah, it, it, got, it got complicated. Is it from do some it? mythical place where dragons exist? Because it sounds like it. So a mordant is usually a mineral salt uh -huh. or a mineral-based... Uh, um, 
ingredient that helps the fi helps the dye bond to the fiber. So you know how gesso works mm -hmm. on a canvas. Mm -hmm. If you have just the plain shiny canvas, the paint doesn't usually stick very well, right? It comes off. But once you put that gesso on, which is another old technique using plaster, yeah, true, right? True. Um, then the uh, the paint has a tooth to grab, right? Mm -hmm. So the root of mordant is to bite the root of the word. So if you think about it as it allows the, the dye stuff to actually go in and adhere to the fiber. Okay. So typically what I use is alum salt and I use iron in the form of like iron pots and iron um, hardware and rusty metal. And <laughs> yeah, that's another thing that I learned. <laughs> I learned with a group here in town called Utah Surface Designers because the other thing, I never saw so many ladies that collect rusted stuff. Yeah, right? <laughs> We love it. We're like you magpies. The first time I saw, and the first time I saw this was actually with scarves. Yes. Right. That they would put keys and, yes. and nails and all this thing that you, you would think, ugh. Right. Gorgeous stuff. Yes. Right? Yeah. And you have your cast iron pan, right? Yeah. So I have a cast iron uh, cookware that I use as sort of my mordant pots, which is really fun. So mm -hmm. pot as mordant is kind of a really old technique as well to to get iron into your cloth, and you can do something as simple as boiling your cloth in the iron kettle okay that's so simple if she, could she put the beans then um yes on an iron kettle so i would put the fabric into a pot and mordant it and then take it out and then um try putting the, the black bean bath on it so first on the iron itself mm -hmm. or the alum iron is really strong okay. so one thing about iron and that's what is worth a What's worth understanding how mordants work because they are pretty, they're pretty serious um, things, right? So mm -hmm. iron is, um, again, we think of things as being natural, as being safe, but too much iron in our bloodstream and in the earth is really bad for us, right? So we don't want to release too much iron. So we want to be able to know how much iron to safely use, okay. right? So that's why I use it from a pot so that it will um, not really release too much all at the same time. Um, this is rusty washers, though. Oh, look at that. So that's like, I just Open wanted to that bring... that so big we can see a little closer. So this was like the second look piece I did. Gorgeous. This look was this. the piece that taught me what mordants do with so plants. So these are rusted, keep, keep holding that, yeah. rusted washers. Washers, yeah. The one that you have in the garage. Find in the parking lot. <laughs> You're walking somewhere and you're like, oh, there's just a rusty piece of metal going somewhere. So yeah, this was rose petals and I didn't get a print from it, but you can see I got color. It was really simple. Um, coffee grounds, rose leaf, sorry, not petal, rusted, rusted washers, and I sprayed vinegar on the washers, which activates the rust. The rust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of people think vinegar is a mordant. That's a common misconception. Vinegar is a modifier of a modifier. pH. Ah. So that's what we get into when we talk about plant dyes. We talk a lot about mordants and modifiers and uh -huh. um, pH adjusters. And those are the things that tend to shift colors around. Uh -huh. is, are there always surprises when you're dying or you pretty much can? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why I like, I'm, because I'm one of those people that once I like fig I crack the code, sort of speak, uh -huh, right? Like uh -huh. I figure out how to do it, and I'm like, oh great, I'm done. Moving on. Yeah. You know, I'm I don't. Like you're probably too. the same way. I, get, I like the challenge. Once, yeah. once challenge is solved, once next you thing. put yeah. all the puzzle pieces yeah. together, it's sort of like a next challenge. Yeah. So that's I think this has kept me going for a long time because there's always new information resurfacing, which is great because there's a big movement now to kind of bring back natural dyes. So that means modern techniques are being utilized. Mm -hmm. And then we're still kind of looking at those ancient techniques as well. I mean, we have thousands of years of plant dye. You, you know, this this is a movement that is coming in many industries. For yes. example, with millennials and jewelry making, yeah. uh, you have a whole movement that they want to use the the primal technique, so right. rust wax casting, right. and you know, doing the whole thing from sourcing the rock to the right. silver meeting. Yeah. And I think that's beautiful yeah. because we need to preserve the legacy that we have created right. as humankind, right? Well, that really gives us hope that people are moving away from that um, everything being processed and made mm -hmm. for them to the process actually being the really beautiful part yes, of making. Yes. Because for me, that's definitely like the process is Because like, once the piece is ready, you say, oh, okay, whatever. Right. right. Yeah. The process is the gem. It's yeah. like, oh, that turned out great, but I sure enjoyed the process of making it. That was so much <laughs> and fun. And now to the next one. Right. Right. <laughs>
Catherine is saying, so I can eat the beans and die with the soap water? Cool. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, Make cool. dinner, mm -hmm. dye yourself a scarf. <laughs> yeah. And she's also saying, yes, please see details on iron and dye. Yes. Because we have to be care careful yes, with that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So all mordants you need to be careful with. Um, you need to be careful with pH, especially iron and copper. So copper is another um, typical mordant that people would use. And okay. again, if you bring the copper pH up too high and you pour that down your drain, that would be really toxic for like aquatic life forms. So okay. you want to think about those things. That's why I really encourage people to... There's a belief that this is sort of easy because we're using things that are natural. so natural yeah, yeah. to our lives. We've got these spices and herbs and plants, but... This is an art form. This is a practice. And it took me a really long time to get my head around mordants. And I'm a research hound. I mean, I probably didn't sleep for two years because I was up like Googling, like, what do mordants do? And how do they work? And, you know, how are they different from synthetic dyes? And can you pour that down the drain? This is a really big thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So my biggest fear is people going home and dumping a bunch of stuff in iron pots and putting vinegar and iron and then just being like, oh, I don't know what to do with this and then dumping it somewhere or worse a family pet gets a hold of it and yes. drinks it right yes. so the, this yeah. is because i have pets and you know i don't have children but my pets are my children it's yeah. the same with and they children. behave the same way right <laughs> right they yeah. don't listen as well sometimes <laughs> <laughs> but um you would never want like a child to yes. get into a mordant bath right yeah. this is a and, good and it doesn't hurt to see in your town where the water goes to yes right because right. it's different from place to place right so you should be aware of that right uh Tell me about the is, uh, this technique now is known as eco printing, um, which is a name that was given to this method by mm -hmm. India Flint. So, can you um, open that and show yes. the camera so they can see? Awesome, beautiful. Yeah. Um, so th like I said, this is one of my very first pieces. Um, and I did, I did study with India. She's a really amazing teacher. Um, it's worth looking up her story of the origination of this kind of art form because um, we talk about that too, you know, source. She's really the source of where this came from. And other people have learned it and changed it and modified it. And I took a class also from Arie Dolman, who's another eco printer that's mm -hmm. an amazing woman as well, an amazing artist. And so, um, knowing the people who have mastered it is really important, right? right and always right. giving respect to them for what they've done, of course. especially India, because she really named this eco-printing because she wanted the process to be eco-friendly, okay. right? And use, you know, natural things and be very mindful of the fibers and the fabric and things like that. So um, leaf prints, eco-prints, I tend to just call it eco-print because okay. I think that word works. But what do you do? Um, so what you do is you mordant your fabric. Okay. Not always, mm -hmm. but sometimes. But sometimes. In this case, it was cotton, so it was it had an iron mordant on top. And then you basically contact the leaf with the fabric, mm -hmm. roll it up, cook it. Oh. So it's a it's. That's why you have those patterns. There. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. by nature, the process is quite simple, but to get good results, right? There's a lot a involved. Lot of yes, yeah. and testing of the leaves. Um, so this was like a test swatch, actually, because I didn't know what was going to happen at that point. I didn't know enough about leaves to know that sumac and maple were going to print. So it was a, it was a surprise to me <laughs> when it came out. I was like, wow, that works really well. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's part of the journey, too, is going through and finding those things in your yard and seeing what the potential is for them. And then when you sort of understand how things work, you can start to get a little more refined with your technique, which is what this would be. Ooh. So this is a piece I did in 2017. So this is um, raw silk or silk knoll. And can I touch it? Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. The touch yeah. is very different yeah. than, wow. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. so this is a totally different process than this. So mordants were also assisted, but this, uh, or were used, but they were employed they were implemented in totally different ways than that because I had learned some new techniques. And this has both um, alum and iron on it. So oh. two different types of mordants. So that, that way you see you're getting a little bit more color from the leaves okay. as opposed to just getting this One. deep dark okay. color, right? So that's where the idea of different processes and different mordants really come into effect the way that the leaf prints work. 
When you say alum, is the same that I can buy in the spice department in the supermarket? Yeah, so yeah. that's what's usually referred to as common alum. Mm -hmm. There are three types of alum. Some are more refined and have a little bit more um, um, minerals in them. So common alum, which is considered the food grade alum, that's what I use on almost all my pieces because cool. it's food grade. I crystals. The other alum, which is aluminum um, acetate, is a really fine powder. So you have to be really careful with it because we hear the word alum. Mm. And what do you think when you think alum? Aluminum. Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. Oh. Yeah. So it's aluminum salts. Oh. So um, we don't want to breathe them. Right. Right. <laughs> I don't want to breathe them. I you shouldn't a, breathe them. I have so. my home and I never use for, for spices, but I have because if you're bleeding, it stops the bleeding yes, it's immediately. A, so it's a, a good thing to have around. A styptic or whatever that's called. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You just put the powder, yeah. whatever you're bleeding right. in. It and it's like a crystal, right? It's kind of a... I didn't have to use oh, so yeah. far, yeah. but I have as a precaution. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope I don't yeah. have to use it. Uh, Davin is saying, I wonder if iron is used on human hair to make a dye more permanent. Um, uh, not the way they go away. They fade so fast. <laughs> I... Me. Um, I've actually been researching natural hair dyes uh -huh. aside from henna because henna, right, is a natural hair dye. Um, so with this, I want to use natural dyes in all of my life, right, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people in India who uh, cook, uh, it's called a mala. And it's actually a very, it's, a, it's also used as a plant dye, a mala berry or Indian gooseberry. And they cook it in an iron pot and then we'll put it on their hair. But I... Mm -hmm can't vouch for if that's a good idea because I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think iron being what it is, it's you absorb iron through your skin. Uh -huh. So you want to be really careful, careful with that. With all of that. Yeah. Laura is saying, I don't know enough about dyeing and textiles to ask a question. Loving the knowledge I'm learning. Oh, oh but thank nice. you for commenting. Yeah. It does make a difference, yeah. Laura. Thank you. So what about that green over there? Yeah, this is a cool one. So um, in, in efforts to sort of not just focus on garments that are white, right? Mm -hmm. So pre-existing color. Okay. So this is kind of cool because this is a synthetic dyed rayon scarf that I purchased. Oh. It was yellow. It was probably the color of that yellow in your shirt. Yeah, okay, I like the yellow. And then I was like, well, I want to transform this. Uh -huh. So I found this at a thrift store and this is a common thing at a thrift store, a little um, rayon pashmina. I don't, huh. I think they're just so common that yeah, people are. just sort of get rid of them. And uh -huh. then, um, so I dyed this with a little bit of iron mordant and then I actually used maple and um, I, it's, oh, rose, rose petal, cause, or rose leaf, because I have a ton of rose leaves uh -huh. in my yard. So um, I think I did a little bit of onion skin, too. So what happens with iron is it tends to deepen color. So you can see how it totally shifted it from the, the plain yellow to this sort of like chartreuse color, which mm -hmm. I love. So this is a, this is a cool so example. So if instead of iron you had used the alum, for example, you would get a total different result. Then. Yeah. Okay. It would be um, probably more bright. So okay. when you think about alum, alum usually gives really bright, bright results. Mm -hmm. Almost things do tend to tend yellow with alum, which is kind of interesting. Almost anything will, will start to tend to a more yellow color mm -hmm. with alum. So where this was already yellow, I was like, we definitely need to darken it up. <laughs> Laura wants to know where can you get the alum? Um, so you can find it at um, kitchen supply stores if you're wanting to get the um, food grade. The food grade, yeah. So it's just um, alum and the, the they use it for pickling and canning. Yeah, yeah. In the spice department, they always yeah. have it. Yeah. You can get it from uh, maybe some arts and crafts supplies, like like big arts and crafts supply okay. stores might might have, have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Now, we talked about the hair dye. Yeah. <laughs> and that reminded me, because I know I have red here, so it yeah. fades really fast. Yeah. Uh, do they keep this color forever? How That's is such it? a good question. I'm glad you asked that. Well, thank so, you. Every um, now and then I have a moment. Yeah. No, you're doing a <laughs> good question. So, um, so with natural dyes, um, the way that you mordant them and prepare the fabric tends to have one of the biggest factors on how the dyes will last. But there's also another factor that's really big, and that is that not all things that give color give lasting color. Uh -huh. So this is where we talk about the fancy word fugitive. So fugitive, fugitive yeah, uh -huh. right? I guess there was a like, TV series with that. Right? Fugitive. 
it's a fugitive die. It needs yeah. to be locked up. So um, it doesn't last. So if you think about the most common one is cabbage. Purple cabbage, it stains your countertops, right, when you cut it. Mm -hmm. um, it's really susceptible to um, heat and pH shifts, but it will, if you put it on a scarf, it will look really pretty immediately, and then it will just vanish. Really? So um, a lot of things that tend to be um, somewhat fragile, like petals, right? Mm -hmm. They're so pretty and they have so much color, but think about the conditions at which flowers wilt, right? It gets too hot, they're like yeah, gone. gone. And they're brown and they're like, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to think about the things that, um, you know, really last tend to be those things that there are flowers that last. When a marigold dries, it's still bright orange. Yeah. So marigolds I've are... Seen, I've seen some of the yes. scarf that they use marigolds. Yeah, it's a they beautiful color. Yeah. So it, it's a really interesting thing because sometimes things that look like they would give a lot of color don't give lasting color. Like beets, for instance, mm. people think, oh, they beets, don't? they're pink, they're so yeah. bright, they stain my hands, my cutting board, everything. They fade to like a yellow almost immediately. Oh, really? So it's a very, um, it's a dye color that tends to be really uh, fugitive. Mm -hmm. So it fades so a lot. So you should avoid or is there a way around it? So that's where it comes into like your personal journey. Like if you're, if you're selling stuff, you want to use things that aren't going to fade as fast, mm -hmm. right? Everything is going to change. I yeah. think that's one thing that's really important to bring up that um, we live in a world who's sort of like, fixated on permanence in a way, right? Yeah. And we know that that shifts for a lot of things, right? With people, and it kind of comes back to the grief thing, right? Like things change, things shift. Um, the, big, <laughs> the biggest thing that fades natural dyes is sunlight. Mm -hmm. So constant exposure to sunlight. But if you took your favorite shirt and left it out on your line for 30 days, synthetic or not, it it's going to fade, gonna fade yeah. or change. Yeah. Yeah. So the use of mordants helps the dye stick and last longer, mm -hmm. right? The proper mordanting process. And then proper scouring helps the dye actually adhere to the fiber. So it's really about the process at which you do and the materials you're using. Mm -hmm. um, testing, that's why testing is so important. Testing your colors, you seeing what happens. You do keep swatches of everything you do, mm -hmm. right? Uh, well, some, this is kind of a swatch. It's just so. <laughs> nice. It's yeah, like right. Wear that right. It's kind of big. It doesn't fit in a book. But yeah, most people will make like a, a dye book, and then that way you can test the swatches and, and expose them to sunlight and see you know what the lasting properties are. And if it's something that is yours, like I have a dress that I just created this year that I I purposely used the fugitive dyes. Oh really? Yeah, I was like, I'm gonna use all the dyes that fade. I'm just gonna try them out because it's my own. So I used um, turmeric, which is another color that people tend oh. to think lasts a uh -huh. long time, but is usually known for fading quite a bit. So I did that, and then I did, um, I think, a petal of some sort that's known for fading. But it sort of became my personal ritual to use something from my garden. And, and uh, helps you embrace change, right? Which is another thing yes. that we we get in our comfort zone and we think change is always bad. Right. Change can be extremely good. Absolutely. But we need to get used to that. So that process that this day, this dress looks so gorgeous. Yeah. Tomorrow is going to fade yep. and I'm going to reinvent it again. Right. Just like I should with my life. And it's not going to look like what it did before. Yeah. It's going to, I might matter. use not the same things. Maybe I'll be traveling somewhere yeah. and I'll find something and roll it up and dye it, <laughs> you know? So yes, it's that um, practice of non-attachment of yes. sort of allowing yes, things to too. be, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So there's that aspect of natural dyes that I really love. I really find that important. Yeah, I think it's, you know, like the onion, uh, everything that we embark uh, has different layers. Yeah, and, totally. And we can see it just as a technique that I need to know the process. Right. Or the deeper levels right. of that process, right? right? Even saving your first swatch to, you said, five years that you've been yeah. doing this. Five years later, I, I bet you see a very different Roxanne oh, totally. when she started because of belly Absolutely. dancing and today, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, and, and that's what we need to look for because we, we are eager. Uh, you know, I, I think we are all used to the YouTube age, right? I don't know how to do something. I go there and I right. look and I, I understand the process. Right. But that's that's really not the the, no. the point. It's right. the why you're going to apply that process and why you're going to stick to that until you you can say, okay, I like what I make now. Right. 
right? And, and understanding the, all the emotions in the process, like being frustrated at first, which is super common, right? I cannot get this so right. So important too. <laughs> it's really important to move through that. Yes, it is important to exercise that. Yeah. So when a difficult time in your life comes and it comes to all of us, it does. You, you, can, you can process that moment and move forward right. and, and not you know, be lost in right. that, that moment. Right. Now, anything else about di natural dying that they should know that you would like to get the word across? Um, I would just say it's worthy of lots of research. It's worthy mm -hmm. of in time and investment. It's a, it's a worthy practice to sort of apply yourself to. Mm -hmm. Even though we do see videos where people make it look easy and they just cook up things yeah. in their yard and house and you know and I did some of that too but I also applied myself to really understanding the history of natural dyes yeah. and where they came from and how they have evolved and maybe even who the leading teachers of our time mm -hmm. are and mm -hmm. why we need to pay attention to what they're doing with a lot of respect so these are things to consider for sure yeah. it's really fun though and then they're bringing <laughs> they're bringing techniques from the past as well. Yes. And incorporating. So what they do is extremely important. Absolutely. And the end result is the uniqueness. I mean, your pieces are Roxanne's. They right. talk about how unique you are. Right. And mine will be different. Yeah. And, you absolutely. Know, Lisa will be different. And and that's what we need to empower that uniqueness because being today in a uh, high-tech world where right. we are in social media, you know, looking every second of what everybody else is doing, sometimes we lose our voice in yes. the process and we need to make sure we know who yeah, we are. Right. And when we make, that comes, I say, this is me, I'm this color, I'm not that color, right? right? I like the unexpected, I like only what I can right. duplicate, but it tells, it tells you about you mo more than anything else. Well, in the practice of... Um letting go to outcomes is really important, especially yes. with this process for me, because there's so many things that we do know how to do and we master them and then we just go and we sit down and we sort of create it and we know somewhat of the results we're going to mm -hmm. get. And at teaching classes, I have to know somewhat of the results. Yes. Like I don't teach classes and be like, it's just a free for all. We're going to see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I don't do that in a class. I wouldn't subject people to that, but um, it's a personal practice that okay. has to happen. It really has to happen. You have to go through those like uncharted territories uh -huh. so you can get your compass back yes, right yes true true <laughs> well it's been really a pleasure yeah, talking to you. I, you I know you know she's an amazing person because when you're around her you tend to be very quiet yeah right <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you know she she's very uh passionate about the things that yeah. you believe Aww, in thanks. right yeah like, absolutely you know, repurposing things, being conscious of the environment, and we need more people like you around, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and that's, again, when you have a chance to learn more about Roxanne and even incorporate some of her beliefs and processes, yeah. because she'll be here uh, in December from 9 to 11, uh, teaching so a, a course yes, it's gonna on, be awesome. on natural dying, yeah. right? Yep. So do, do you have an idea what we are going to be learning in that course? So we're going to learn um, my technique for bundle dyeing using extracts. So we're going to be using some similar item we're going to be doing some similar similar items to this, to this. yeah uh -huh. and we'll learn some folding techniques nice. we're going to learn mordants um, in in and out of mordants and we're also going to learn how to explore and experiment with items in your own backyard which that's i think cool. is really important too uh-huh that's so. fantastic so Put in your calendar December 9, 10, and 11 at CuriousMondo.com. Uh, look for the registration page in a few days. It's free to watch while we are live, so you don't want to miss this opportunity at all. Start talking to people about that because, again, it's it's something that we need to preserve, Yes. right? And we need to get in the mindset of not just purchasing things all the time, but repurposing things so it doesn't end in the landfill, in oceans, right? right. And all those sad things we see out there. Right. Thank Thank you so yeah, much. Thank yes. you. Thank you for watching. And thank you so much for your participation, your questions, and to those that have shared this podcast. Uh, note that the, whatever you're watching right now, this podcast stays there. It doesn't go away. So you can tell people to come and watch. And of course, in a few days, we'll be in all the podcast directories. So you use the one that you like. And don't forget to give us a rate, a review, a like. All those things matter a lot to how visible we become to people. We bring here artists and inspiration every single week. So we count on you as our ambassadors out there. Thank you so much. I'll see you back here next week. I have a very cool guy coming next week. We are going to talk about leather craft. Okay, join me next week at creativityfocus.com. Thank you so much for your time.